Good morning. Once again, you are joining us via the internet online service of Fairfield Presbyterian Church. Uh, just a few announcements. Again, we are open on Sunday mornings for up to 50 with face masks, and it's a truncated service, but it's still worship together, and we do encourage one another, giving virtual hugs and greetings. And so we want you to join with us if you are able. But we're thankful that we can provide the service for those who don't feel comfortable. One of the things we've been noting is the church members bringing uh, handwritten verses on index cards, which uh, have been collected by Barbara Ernst and Julie Miller, and the, our bulletin board of Bible verses is growing, and it really is an encouragement. Uh, I will take a photograph and we'll post it on the church Facebook page. So let's prepare our hearts for worship in the bulletin. And again, all the information is on the church homepage, the order of service and the text and all those things. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Our gracious God calls us to worship. Here is his call this morning. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And the response, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. Now you may pause the service, and on the home page you'll find the embedded hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Our confession of faith this morning is from the Westminster Confession of Faith. For those of you not aware of what that is, it is a statement of faith that was really a systematic expression of what we believe the Bible teaches, and it was drafted from 1641 to 1647 by an act of parliament in Westminster Abbey in uh, London, England, and so hence Westminster Confession of Faith. This is chapter 14 on saving faith, and so those of you watching the service will respond with the bold portion, but let's confess our faith together. The gift of faith enables the elect to believe thus saving our souls. Ordinarily, this is brought about by the ministry of the word as the spirit of Christ works in our hearts. By participating in baptism and the Lord's Supper through prayerful communication with God, our faith increases and is strengthened. Through faith, a Christian believes to be true what God reveals in his word. God speaks with his own authority from the word, this produces new behavior, resulting from obedience to the teaching in each particular text. Faith generates godly fear at the warnings of Scripture while encouraging us to embrace God's promises for this life and life eternal. The essential actions of faith are accepting, receiving, and resting in Jesus Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life through the merit of God's covenant of grace. Faith may be weak or strong. Often it may be variously attacked and weakened, but it gains the victory. It matures in many believers to the level of full assurance through the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Beloved, I pray that your faith is strong this morning and uh, weak or strong, Faith will have the victory, and we rejoice in that. This is our confession of faith this morning. As you know, if you do watch the news from time to time, you see that our nation is in turmoil. Democrat, Republican are against one another, liberal, conservative. As believers, our citizenship is in heaven, first of all. And uh, there was a minister who came to our presbytery at one time, and he presented a uh, book, Charles uh, Garriott. Uh, prayers for Trump, petitions for the 45th president. By the way, he had written one for President uh, Barack Obama as well. 
And so as citizens of the kingdom of God and citizens of this country, we are called to pray for those who are in power. And so let's do that today. The prayer this morning is for the words that President Trump uses. Indeed, he needs prayer for that, as we all do, for we will be judged by every idle word that comes from our mouth, and that ought to terrify us. And so let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we come to you, O Lord, who has spoken to us over the course of time through your servants and prophets. Your spoken word has always been a significant part of your relationship with creation, and especially your people. You have given us the great gift of your Son, the Word that has become flesh. In all these ways, you have revealed to us your holiness, glory, grace, and love. The words spoken by President Trump are critical for the health and well-being of our nation. We pray that you would give him great discernment, insight, and wisdom as he addresses our nation and world. May he know when it is appropriate to convey his opinion and directions and when to remain silent. Direct his words whenever he gives an executive order. May the reporting agent, the press secretary, the world's media accurately convey our president's messages. May we, the people of this great nation, carefully consider all that he says and help us to listen and discern rightly how to respond graciously to our president. We ask you, O Lord, to hear our prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, we've moved on from chapter 6 in the Gospel of Luke, finally, the Sermon on the Plain, having been finished. We come now to Luke 7, and we'll pick it up at verse 1. Let's pray for God's grace. Lord, the, the reading, the hearing, the preaching, and the obe obeying of your word, may, may you bless it to our hearts. Please, Heavenly Father, in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Luke 7, verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Soon afterward, he went to a town near called Nain. And his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable, considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the buyer, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us. And God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. When God came to the people in the wilderness, descending to the peak of Sinai, and he spoke from the cloud with lightning flashing and thunder pealing, the earth quaking and the mountain blazing with fire, the children of Israel were terrified. They were frightened, and they 
no longer wished to hear the word of the Lord directly, so they said they wanted a mediator. And so in Deuteronomy 18, verse 17, the Lord is addressing Moses, and he says, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak in my name, speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, or if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And so this speaks of all the prophets that would follow Moses, but especially it speaks to Jesus, the ultimate prophet of God's word. And when Jesus raises the widow's son from the dead, the people are afraid. They are terrified and they declare, a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. How did they know that a great prophet was among them? Because what Jesus said would happen came to pass. What did he say? He said, young man, I say to you, rise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. You wonder what he was saying. I imagine him saying praises to the Lord. And then Jesus gave him to his mother. This was a true prophet, and he should be feared. And you may ask, why feared and not loved? Well, indeed, we're called to love him as well. And this is a good question, and we'll get to that later on in the message. But what we have here is a record of the work that the Father gave Jesus to do. These works of healing, as we've said Elsewhere, authenticate Jesus as the promised Christ of God. They weren't his primary mission. His primary mission was to preach the gospel of the kingdom. But these miracle healings and signs and wonders vindicated him and verified him as God's promised Christ. What we see in these particular works is an example of remarkable faith, the faith of the centurion and the compassionate love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith and love, these are the themes of this morning's message. In the first of these works, we look to the centurion. Jesus marvels at the faith of a man, and get this, he does not see. There is no direct communication between the two. There are mediators, there are go-betweens. Uh, initially, there are the elders of the Jews and then his friends who, when Jesus is coming to the house, the friends go out to meet Jesus and give the message. So uh, this, these two never met. Uh, and this was really a part of Jesus' acclaim about this Gentile's faith. This Roman centurion was a part of the occupying force in Israel and of course, uh, he was a commander of some 80 legionnaires. The Romans were despised by the Jews, but this man was loved. Why? Well, it seems that he had adopted the faith of the Jews in the true and the living God revealed in the scriptures of the Old Testament. The Roman gods were in essence copies of the Greek gods, and then you had what were called uh, mystery religions, and the essence of these religions was especially the secrecy associated with the particulars of their initiatory rites and the rituals they practiced. And these things were not revealed to outsiders, and so hence they were the mystery religions. But apparently this Roman commander uh, has eschewed these religions and has come to believe in the true and the living God. And so he, perhaps he found faith there, there while stationed in Israel. But he hears that Jesus is in the region, and so he sends the Jewish elders of that town to meet with the Lord. And when they come to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, 
He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. This man's love for Israel and his provision for building of their synagogue was evidence of his faith in the true and the living God. And he was what we, we would call a God-fearer. That was next to being a Jew. Uh, to be a full-blown Jew, one, a male, would need to be circumcised. And so perhaps this Roman soldier did not go that far, but he believed in the true and the living God and provided a place of worship and teaching and instruction for his community. So he is worthy to have you do this for him, they say. But now another proof that God was at work in his heart is the centurion's sense of his own unworthiness that he expressed before the Lord. As I said, the elders called him worthy for Jesus to do this work for him. But the soldier humbly declares his unfitness that Jesus should even enter his house. So we read in verses 6 and 7, when he, that is Jesus, was not far from the house, a centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. And so here you see this man with great respect. He is uh, holding Jesus in a great light. Would that the leaders of the Jews would have had such respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's also aware of the power and the authority of Jesus. Verse 8, he says, I too am a man set under authority, the soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and the other, come, and he comes, and to my servant. And that was this servant who was near death, one whom this man loved and apparently needed. This was a man who served this centurion well. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And Jesus is amazed. He marvels so that he turns around to face the crowd that was following him. And he says, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And so you see here this Gentile uh, Roman, this, this, what the Jews would say is a Gentile sinner. Here he expresses faith. And beloved, this would be the work of God in his heart. I have not found in Israel such faith. And we read in Hebrews 11.1, 1, what is faith? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The centurion had hoped for the healing of his servant. And he was certain that Jesus had the power to do it. And he had the, the understanding that Jesus, if he really had authority from God, he didn't have to go up to his servant. He could say a word and his servant would be healed. Such faith was great faith. We read in Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And it really appears that this soldier, this centurion, the commander of Roman armies, he was a man who was believing that God existed, rejecting the gods of Rome. He believed so much that he earnestly sought out the Lord Jesus. And perhaps his reason for sending the elders was because he believed that Jesus might not give him a hearing but he yet expressed faith. He sent somebody to pursue the Lord Jesus, and he was rewarded. Now, this man seems to have a strong faith. How is your faith this morning? Well, listen, dear friends, there are always seasons of the soul, times when our faith is strong and sure, times when there's nothing that can shake us in our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are those times when we may be struggling with sin or maybe in such a time like this with the coronavirus pandemic that our faith grows weaker. We wonder, is God really there? Some trial comes to our life and it doesn't go the way we want. 
And so we wonder, does God really love us? True faith, weak or strong, will always have the victory. There is another account where a man needed uh, a work from Jesus. In Mark 9, where a man has a child that is possessed by a demon. In verse 21, we read, And Jesus asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, and it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. Do you see that? What an interesting response, an honest response. I believe, Jesus, that you are able to heal, but I have doubt. There is still unbelief in my heart, so I'm asking you to help my unbelief. And this, dear friends, is a response of true faith. We need to pray for the Lord to bolster our faith, and we need to build one another up in our faith. God uses us and one another to strengthen the other's faith. And so, weak or strong, your faith will have the victory. May it be that we have faith like the centurion. But if not, the Lord will, will strengthen us as well. We move now to the second of the works the Father gave him to do, and that is uh, the display of his compassionate love. Jesus was a man of great compassion. Now, in the next of these works, it is important to clearly understand and describe the scene of what's going on. In verse 11, we read, soon afterward, that is after the healing of the centurion servant, uh, Jesus goes to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him, a mega crowd, a large crowd, could be hundreds, even uh, 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 thousands or a few thousand people. We, we read in verse 12, and as he drew near the gates of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So you have to get this picture in your mind, Jesus and the crowd following him coming into the town and the funeral procession with, with a large crowd following the widow and the, those carrying the funeral buyer, they're coming out of the town. And so imagine that. It, one crowd is filled with mourners, some of them paid professionals, loud and demonstrable in their grief. It's uncomfortable as the crowds are jockeying for position. It's loud. It's mass confusion. That's the scene. Thousands of people, two crowds going in the opposite direction, and there is Jesus. He has a laser focus on this woman. And when the Lord saw her, that is this grieving widow, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. So imagine that, this large crowd of mass confusion, Jesus focuses on this woman. She's grieving. To those close enough to hear Jesus' words to the widow, do not weep, they must have seen cruel immediately. They must have been indignant. Why shouldn't she weep? She's a widow who's just lost her only son. Her future was uncertain with no fell male family member uh, to look out for her. She would have been right for uh, someone to take advantage of her. And so, boy, if ever there was a time for weeping, it was it. This was it. Jesus, be reasonable. She has every right to weep. But in the midst of this large group of people, the Lord finds this woman and has moved to the core of his being to bring her comfort. And then he came up and he touched the funeral buyer. He stopped the bearers of his casket in their tracks. And they stood still. Young man, I say to you, arise. 
And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. And the response is a great fear. Again, the trauma of holiness. God had visited them. And then the amazement. A prophet from God was in their midst. They give glory to God. And this was the appropriate response. Glory be to God for the work of God. God was in their midst. But that's not why Jesus performed this work. Again, it was a work that God had given him to do. But he healed this woman out of his compassion for her. Compassion is a deep form of love. One writer says that compassion is the best apologetic for the Christian. That is the defense of our faith. Do you really want to see God and his Christ and then be compassionate with those who are in need? Uh, the Greek word that we translate compassion means to feel with em empathy to the depths of one's bowels. The English compassion means to feel deeply with someone. Uh, Kate Shelnut for Christianity Today, she uh, writes that there are three aspects of compassion. Giving to, doing for, and being with. And she notes that the first two can be done at a distance. You can give to someone in need by writing a check. You, you can give them money and send them on their way. We can put money in the offering plate. And by the way, Faithful Church is a gracious and compassionate church. Uh, looking at, um, yeah, uh, while reading in Christianity Today, they noted that um, evangelical Christians, conservative Christians, give more than their liberal counterparts. Uh, and they note that uh, Christians give 4.4% of their uh, income. It was noted that evangelical churches give just over 2% to the work of missions. And that's still greater than a lot of people in this world. And by the way, I want to encourage you and your faith and thank you, Fairfield Church, in our budget. That again, churches, the average was two over just over 2% of their budget going to missions and benevolence. Uh, Fairfield Church gives over 25%, I believe it's 28% of our budget to the needs of others, missionary endeavors, uh, the Deacon's Fund, and other opportunities to give. So praise the Lord, but that's giving at a distance. You give to. Compassion is also expressed in doing for, doing for those who are unable to help themselves. And I remember uh, when I was the associate pastor at Westminster Church in Muncie, Indiana, we sent down, uh, I went with a team of teenagers who went to work with 150 others. We were building and rebuilding and remodeling a school uh, compound. It had a wall around it. There were people building the wall. Uh, my job was to mix concrete and then do some cement finishing uh, for a basketball court. There were others who were sanding and repainting desks and cleaning the school building up. And then, and then, there were those students. So we were doing for those people. And you can do for someone dispassionately. You can bandage someone's wound and not have great feeling for them. But there were students who knew Spanish. And one of the students, a young girl, came up to me and she said, you know, I feel so guilty. I see all of you working so hard uh, at the task of making the school uh, shine more brightly. And I said to this young girl, you are doing a more significant work. Because what she was doing was speaking with the children in the school compound, playing with them. She was demonstrating the compassion of Christ. For the one other aspect of compassion is to be with someone. Compassion especially is seen when we are with those in need and trouble. And it requires that, that we show up, all of us, body, mind, heart, and soul. And dear friends, compassion is not something that can be taught by a lecture or a sermon alone. There must be examples of compassion given. And that's what we find in the gospel. 
many examples of Jesus showing compassion to those who were hurting, like this woman restoring her son in her life. Or like the thief on the cross speaking words of forgiveness and mercy. Or the uh, lepers who beg for Jesus to heal them and he touches them. Jesus was a man of compassion. And so to grow in compassion, it's, it's a process. It's a process of self-discovery. And it is an art. It must be practiced. Kate uh, Shelnut goes on to write, compassion is nourishment for relationships. It holds families and communities together. Relationships grow stronger through compassion. And this ability to be there for others, when it counts, speaks louder than any words. When people are truly there for one another in their darkest hour, the bonds of trust and love go deep. The sense that someone will love you despite your imperfections and your failings builds lifelong friendships and true communities of faith. People want to be a part of congregation because of the quality of relationships in it. And dear friends, it's been noted of Fairfield Church, when we were able to meet together, when visitors come, they have the sense that Fairfield is a loving church by the way you speak to one another, by the way when we find opportunities to serve, we do so. That is why, beloved, it's so important to gather together to worship the Lord. And, and again, if you're able to meet, thankfully you can enjoy the service online, but if you are able to meet, come to the sanctuary and join with us. One final thought here. The practice of compassion also develops our ability to accept our own imperfections. For those of you out there who beat yourselves up mercilessly, who have sinned greatly and believe there's no way that God could forgive you, hear what you're saying. You're saying that your sin is too great for God to forgive through the work of his son Jesus. When you look at others who are great sinners and you've had compassion on them, you've shown them mercy, love, you've done something for them, you've been there for them. How can you not say that God will be not be there for you when you fail and you want to beat up on yourself? You can look at yourself with God's loving kindness instead as you grow in compassion for others. Dear friends, that's the only way I've gotten through because there are many times I find it hard to believe that God would love me. And so let us grow in our faith, knowing that true faith, weak or strong, will gain the victory. And let us grow in compassion, following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and praying that God give us opportunities to show compassionate love to others. For, as we said, that is the greatest apologetic the Christian has. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message and we pray your blessing upon it. Hear us, O Lord. Give us opportunities to demonstrate our faith. And thank you that Fairfield Church is a generous, gracious, compassionate church. Lord, we have so much more to grow in. So help us, God. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, dear friends, if you would, you pause the service, and on the home page you'll find the hymn, Like a River Glorious. Like a River Glorious is God's perfect peace. And now, receive this blessing this benediction with grace. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed, and he remembers that we are dust. And now you'll find on the homepage the Gloria Patri.